Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. Today, we are going to switch it up a bit and turn our attention from the Aryan Brotherhood to La Mafia Mexicana, specifically focusing on Luis Buff Flores and the years prior to his introduction to the California Department of Correction in 1961. But before we begin, a quick word from our sponsor. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. On August 16, 1940, Luis Jesse Flores was born in Los Angeles County to parents William Garcia Flores and Francis Lujan Flores. He grew up fascinated by the gangsters in the movies and in the headlines, such as Bugsy Siegel and Mickey Cohen. According to newspaper accounts, Weddle Buff was first arrested at the age of 14 and had regular run-ins with law enforcement due to being a very active member of Barrio Hawaiian Gardens. These activities led to his eventual commitment to the California Youth Authority and an auto theft charge out of Orange County resulted in his placement at the Dual Vocational Institution in 1957. Weddle Buff is the originator of the idea of a gang of gangs. His vision was to bring together the cream of the crop of the Mexican gang underworld behind the walls as carnales or brothers instead of fighting amongst themselves as street gang rivalries dictated. The newly formed gang then leveraged their power base to take what they wanted and enjoy the small creature comforts, both legal and illegal, available in prison so they could do easy time. As the Mexican mafia matured, they would seek to take over all the rackets in prison formalize their code of conduct or reglas, complete with a death roll, move out to the streets and become a modern-day organized crime syndicate. But at this point, Weddle Buff put it best when he said, it was just a kid's trip then, just a branch of our homeboys from Los Angeles. If I felt like killing somebody, I would. If I didn't, I wouldn't. We were just having fun. The power we enjoyed was intoxicating. Although Weddle Buff was the originator of the idea of a super gang, he was not the shot caller or boss of the gang. Weddle Buff was wise enough to realize that men of this caliber and ego would never allow themselves to be subservient to anyone. All members, or carnales, are of equal status and the gang is governed by a democratic system whereby each man has an equal vote. Weddle Buff knew the future of the gang was in the adult prison system and advise his carnales to get into the adult system as soon as possible and begin establishing their power base as they did in DVI. Up until 1958, no wards or convicts had died or been murdered at DVI. The first two deaths were of wards that took place during escape attempts. Dennis O. Brown, age 19, was shot off the fence and died on February the 17th, 1958 and James R. Hess Jr., age 19, was shot off the fence and killed on May the 26th, 1958. But the first murder of a ward or a convict took place on June the 17th, 1958. This first murder coincided with the Mexican Mafia's first steps at organizing themselves behind the walls. On June the 17th, 1958, Luis G. Martinez, age 19, convicted of armed robbery and narcotics out of Los Angeles, was fatally stabbed. Angel R. Nino, age 19, convicted of grand theft out of Los Angeles, was stabbed non-fatally. And Victor M. Rico, age 20, convicted of auto theft out of Los Angeles, was also stabbed non-fatally in the same incident. DVI authorities reported to the press that a gang of about 25 to 30 youths of Mexican descent converged very quickly and then separated and filtered amongst the other inmates engaged in after-dinner talk and minor play on the exercise yard. Another article reported there were two fights, one right after the other. This has become a well-known technique employed when conducting hits on a yard where a distraction is created by a fight while the intended target is moved on in a separate attack. Authorities didn't think anything was amiss until the inmates separated revealing the injured wards. Martinez died at 6.30 p.m. in the prison hospital approximately 15 minutes after he was stabbed. 
A sharpened piece of metal was found in the exercise yard about 200 yards away from the location of the disturbance. On June the 26th, 1958, Widow Buff confessed to stabbing Angel Arnino and possibly Victor M. Rico in the melee. However, he denied stabbing Luis Martinez. He said he became involved in the fight when he was hit over the head with a stick by another ward, and he then pulled a knife and started slashing at the crowd of inmates involved in the fight. Widow Buff's case took a twisting and turning route through the legal system. On June the 27th, 1958, he was arraigned in Tracy Judicial Court and was certified to juvenile court. Weddell Buff waived his preliminary hearing and the reading of the complaint against the advice of his public defender. He was facing a single count of assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to commit murder. Weddell Buff was once again arraigned in Tracy Judicial Court, July the 29th, 1958. He was previously certified to juvenile court but the juvenile court sent him back when it ruled that Weddell Buff's alleged confession made him ineligible for consideration by the California Youth Authority. A preliminary hearing was set for August the 5th. On August 11th, 1958, Weddell Buff was sentenced to state prison after pleading guilty to one count of assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to commit murder. It appeared that he was all washed up, but appearances can be deceiving. The court was not informed of Weddell Buff's age at the time that he was sentenced and only became aware that he was a minor on the evening of the sentencing hearing. Superior Court Judge George F. Buck set aside Weddell Buff's sentence the day after he imposed it because Weddell Buff did not meet the minimum age requirement as he was only 17 years old at the time. The judge instructed both the defense and prosecuting attorneys to advise him of the age of youthful offenders that appeared before him in the court. Weddell's Buff case was referred to the probation department for a report to be submitted on August the 25th. Furthermore, the judge asked the California Youth Authority to decide whether it would accept Weddell Buff for placement. He also ruled that if the CYA rejected him or did not accept him within 15 days, Weddell Buff was to begin serving a state prison sentence term. On September the 16th, 1958, the California Youth Authority notified the court that it would accept Weddell Buff and designate a DVI for his preliminary detention assignment. He no doubt was welcomed back by his brothers with open arms, and they continued establishing La Mafia Mexicana's dominance at DVI. But this was not the last impact this incident had on the fellas. It continued to bear fruit in the form of violence behind the walls, and it followed the Emmy into the adult system. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. By 1960, Weddell Buff was paroled from the CYA and was back on Broadway doing his thing, robbing and stealing. On the night of October the 2nd, 1960, Weddell Buff, now 20 years old, and three accomplices robbed the village market in Fullerton located at 1031 West Commonwealth Avenue. The crew got away with $120 and took the wallets of two customers. The four robbers were pursued by the police as they attempted to make their getaway and they exchanged fire with a merchant patrolman and a police officer as they fled through the upscale Sunny Hills neighborhood. The driver of the getaway car lost control of the vehicle and crashed. All the suspects fled on foot. Weddell Buff and Cleto T. Rodriguez, age 20, ran one direction. Howard Cappy Pacini, age 23, from Hawaiian Gardens, and Richard Franco, age 19, ran the opposite direction. Weddell Buff and Rodriguez were captured a few hours after fleeing on foot from the wrecked vehicle. Cappy Pacini, Weddell Buff's fellow Hawaiian Garden homeboy and future M. Carnal, and Franco were arrested on October the 5th, 1960, in the Hawaiian Gardens area. Pacini and Rodriguez pled guilty to second-degree robbery charges and were committed to Chino to begin serving their sentence. Franco was turned over to the CYA, and Fullerton dismissed the charges against Weddell Buff due to insufficient evidence. However, he was handed over to the Gardena police for an armed robbery warrant for the October 1, 1960 armed robbery of Leon's Market located at 15408 South Van Ness Avenue. Weddell Buff did not escape this beef. He was eventually convicted of this armed robbery and sentenced to the California Department of Corrections. 
Weddell Buff was received at San Quentin in August of 1961. It may seem like a lengthy period between his capture on October the 2nd, 1960, and his arrival at the Big Q in August of 1961. But even at this time, the fellas manipulated the courts. By April of 1961, Weddell Buff had already requested and received eight continuances, five at the municipal court level and three at the superior court level. Continued delays and trickery would hold up Weddell Buff's entrance into the California Department of Corrections. As noted earlier, the melee that resulted in the death of Martinez and the non-fatal stabbing of Nino and Rico by Weddell Buff would return to haunt the Emmett, specifically Alejandro Hondo Lechuga. Hondo was born on July 8, 1940. He was Weddell Buff's fellow Hawaiian Gardens homeboy and co-founder of the Mexican Mafia. He too was paroled from CYA by 1960. On May the 31st, 1960, Newport Beach Police battled 30 youths at Rock Point Cove. The group consisted mostly of youths from Corona and Chino High School on a senior ditch day. Sergeant William Saunders, Sergeant Dick Heineke, and Officer James Parker suffered cuts to their face as a result of the disturbance. One of the rioters was 20-year-old Alex Lechuga, better known as Hondo. He was booked on suspicion of disturbing the peace resisting an officer and assault and battery. However, it was Hondo's conviction on July 6, 1960 for possession of marijuana that punched his ticket into the California Department of Corrections. Hondo was received at Soledad Prison in September of 1960. On October 9, 1961, a group of 12 Mexicans and blacks were watching television in one of Soledad's day rooms when a member from one of the groups stood up and blocked the view of the others. This action sparked a brief but intense clash between the groups that lasted three to four minutes before guards were able to break it up. The inmates used chairs, fists, and one wielded a straight razor. Three convicts were, wound were wounded by razor slashes, but two only received minor injuries. Hondo was the third inmate who suffered the most severe slashes from the straight razor. His attacker slashed Hondo on the side of his head, one at the back of his head, and other minor cuts to his body. Hondo was taken to the hospital for treatment and was listed in good condition. Prison officials found the straight razor, which they believed was stolen from the barber shop. The administration suspected that although the fight was sparked by the issue over the television, the men involved had a long-standing dispute. This was most likely a continuation of the ongoing struggle between the Chicanos and the Blacks to assert themselves as the hogs with the biggest balls behind the walls. Sometime after this incident, and before February the 27th of 1962, Hondo was transferred to San Quentin. On February the 27th, 1962, he was stabbed in San Quentin's Adjustment Center by Angel R. Nino. This is the same Angel R. Nino that Weddell Buff pled guilty to assaulting on June the 17th, 1958, on the DVI exercise yard. It appears that Nino had a long memory and wanted some payback. He would go on to be tried two times for the stabbing of Hondo, and both times the trials ended in hung juries, voting 8-4 to four in favor of acquittal. The district attorney would not seek to try the case a third time. After the two trials, he recommended to the Marin Superior Court judge that the case be dismissed, which he promptly did so. Although the Mexican Mafia likes to portray itself as the protector of the Chicano convict population, a.k.a. La Raza, as you can see from the melee on June the 17th, 1958, some of its first victims were fellow Chicanos. If you weren't part of the clica, you were fair game because as the MS Code of Conduct clearly spells out, the mariposa comes first before everyone and everything else, hasta la tumba, or until the wheels fall off. Well, I'd better end it here before Mundo finds out I'm encroaching on his turf and puts me on the lista for a one-way trip to Brazil. Stay tuned for more revelations about early image history. Good night and God bless.